The scripture reading this morning will come out of the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. You're going to find that on your pew Bibles on page 854. You're going to do Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Appreciate the presence of everyone this morning. Glad that you are here with us at the Beltline Road Church of Christ. We're thankful for uh, coming out and worshiping with us in spirit and truth, and we look forward to seeing you again if you're visiting with us. We'd love to have you come often. We're thankful that you have been with us this morning. For the past several weeks, we've been discussing our in Christ identity, who we are as Christians. Today, we'll be talking about the way. Christians in the first century were called the way. And they followed the way. And Jesus Christ is the way. And so we'll be talking at length concerning that particular concept and that phrase. But as we think about where we have been for the past several weeks, the idea is that we need to remember that we are born again, born from above, out of water, out of spirit. We need to also understand That we're children of God by virtue of the new birth. Children of God. Sons and daughters of God. That's who you and I are. We are also slaves to and for Jesus Christ. Jesus has freed us so that we can become slaves to Him. And so it's an incredible concept that we have the freedom to be slaves in Christ Jesus. We also know that we need to be saints. That is, we need to be sanctified. That we need to be holy. The idea of sanctification is the process or the idea of setting oneself aside for the purposes of God. And so in that sense, we are all saints. And of course, we need to be strangers as we talked about In Bible class this morning, strangers to the world, strangers for God. At one time we were alienated, the Bible tells us. At one time we were strangers to God. But now we have been brought together by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that reason, He tells us to become strangers to where we have come from. To be strangers to sin, to be strangers to the world. We also discussed the idea that we are living stones in Jesus Christ. Each one of us is a living stone being part of that building we call the church. And each one has a role and each one has a task in that church, in that body. And then last week we talked about the idea of being soldiers. That when we came up out of the waters of baptism... The Lord Jesus enlisted us in His army. And whether we knew it or not, we entered into a war, a war that we could not start, never did start, but a war we are part of nonetheless. And we have targets on our back because Satan loves to launch his darts, his fiery darts of temptation at each of us. But we need to stand as members of the Lord's army. And so that brings us to a story I was reminded of. Story of an older woman who had entered into the church building to worship. And as she's walking down the aisle, she was checking out each of the rows and each of the seats. And she didn't like any of the rows or the seats that she saw. And so she kept on walking. Until she came down to the front row and she sat down in the front seat. At that time, an elder came up to her and said, Well, good morning, sister. 
Uh, I know you might want to sit here in the front row, but let me tell you and let me assure you, you do not want to sit in the front row. After all, our preacher is very boring and you'd hate to fall asleep in front of his eyes. And she turned to the elder and she said, do you know who I am? And he said, no ma'am, I I don't. Because I'm the preacher's mother. And he turned to her and said, do you know who I am? And she says, no sir, I don't. He said, good. (laughs) Identity. Who are we in Christ Jesus? Every week we come and we assemble together on the Lord's Day to remind ourselves who we are in Christ. It's because of that wonderful feast we just partook of that we can do that each week. That we come in here, remind ourselves who we are, remind ourselves of the mistakes we made during the week, And understand by the grace of God, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all our sins and all our unrighteousness. And we have a fresher perspective for the coming week. Isn't it a grand thing to think of that we begin our work week, our week, we begin with worship. It's on the first day of the week we come and we remember Jesus We remember who we are. And we remember that this is not our home. And we remember we work for a mighty Savior. And that puts our our whole week, our coming week in perspective. And each day of the week, it'll, it'll have its own trials, its own tribulations, its own problems. Until we meet on Wednesday again to strengthen each other up and build each other up in the most holy faith. And then we just have a few more days until it returns to the first day of the week where we once again can remind ourselves of who our Lord is and who we are in relationship to Him. What a blessing that is that we can do that. And so we get to reconnect reconnect ourselves to the way, to the way. And we'll be talking about the way this morning. That's our identification as Christians, as those who are in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul talks about the way in the book of Acts. You're going to find that expression, the way, in the book of Acts only. And really you're going to find it mostly with the Apostle Paul as Luke records that expression. But you recall that in Acts chapter 9, verse 2, where Paul was said to be persecuting the way. And of course we know that he was persecuting the church. And so we understand that the way is the church. And he was persecuting the church which was in the way. You and I, members of the Lord's church together, are in the way. We are in the way of salvation. We are in the way of righteousness. And so when Paul talks about the way, he's encompassing following Jesus Christ who has given us the way to follow. And so it seems heavy on Paul's heart at the beginning of his ministry to talk about the way. In chapter 18 of the book of Acts, we come across a man by the name of Apollos. He was mighty in the scriptures. He was an eloquent man. He was a very good preacher. But he only knew of the baptism of John, unfortunately. And it says... He was instructed in the way, however. But a little bit later, the next verse, in verse 26, the Bible tells us that Priscilla and Aquila had come to him and taught to him the way more accurately. And so, while he was mighty in the Scriptures, and while he was a very eloquent man, that he was able to teach and to preach 
in a way that people could understand, he was still wrong. And he needed to be corrected about the way. The right ways of God. We have the right ways of God because we have a right Savior. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one in this world, no one in any generation, no one from the beginning of time till time immemorial, no one can come to the Father except or by or through Jesus Christ. He is the pinnacle of gates. He's the one gate that we need to go through. All people need to go through the door of the great shepherd to enter into his fold. But it's only by his blood are we sanctified. Are we justified? Are we washed? And are we made whole? And so we're thankful. We have such a good shepherd, such a good friend, and such a way that he has provided for us as we continue our walk with him. The Bible also tells us in Acts chapter 22 and verse 4, Paul was before certain people and he reminded them that he said, I persecuted the way unto death. Giving us more of an idea that he was persecuting the church or the way. A church was in the way. And of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, Paul said that he was not worthy to be an apostle because he persecuted the church of God. But yet he persecuted the way. And so in Acts chapter 8, at the beginning of Paul, who was ruining the church at the time in Jerusalem, it said Paul made havoc of the church. That's what Paul was doing. He was against the way. He was trying to destroy the way. In fact, in Galatians chapter 1, that's the very words he used. He said, or at least concerning Paul, the people were saying, isn't he the one that tried to destroy the way, but who now preaches the faith? The way is equal to the faith. The way is equal to the gospel. The way is equal to that way which Christ has given you and me to follow. And from the passage that was just read by our brother, the idea is that way. We enter into a narrow way. We enter in by a narrow gate because broad is the gate and broad is the way that many enter into. But those who enter in by the narrow gate and the narrow way, few find that way. Relatively speaking, that's a lot of people. A lot of people from the beginning of time until the end of time, many people would have trodden the long, hard, easy way, if you will. And that is the broad way, the wide way, with the wide gate. And very few will have trodden the narrow way, will have walked through the narrow gate. Now, it's interesting to me that in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14, he says about the way, he says, and difficult is the way. So, as Christians, we understand that our task and on our journey with Jesus Christ, it's not always going to be easy. It's, in fact, is going to be difficult. Difficult. And so Jesus tells us that we need to count the cost. Knowing that being with Jesus is going to be difficult and not easy, we need to make that decision whether we should follow Jesus or not. But we know this, by making the right choice, 
by making the right decision and following Jesus. And although it will be difficult, it sure has a far better reward. And the whole point about following Jesus is the idea or the concept that this world is not our home. Our home is prepared for us and our citizenship is in heaven, Paul says. And so why bother thinking about this world? Why bother putting our hopes and dreams into this world when we ought to be putting our hearts, minds, hopes and dreams in that world, in the world to come, in a world where Jesus is. That's the world we're striving for. That's the world that we need. And so the way is not a final destination. Unfortunately, a lot of people think once they've entered into the church, that that's all there is. Now I'm a Christian. I'm now part of the Lord's church and now I'm on easy street. Never has been that way and never will be that way. The idea is that when we enter into the way, we enter into a journey along the way with Jesus. We haven't arrived. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14, Paul says, I haven't arrived yet. Now you just think about how dedicated Paul was to Jesus and how he took it seriously. And yet he could say, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, I haven't arrived yet. I haven't arrived yet. And if Paul hasn't arrived yet, I know I haven't arrived yet. But I keep pressing on. I kept pre keep pressing on ahead, forward, to the upward call of Christ uh, in Christ Jesus. And so we are to enter into the church, but we are to continue growing. That's the idea of the concept of the way. The way is talking about progress. The way is talking about the way. You know, just as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, He was saying, I'm exclusive. You can't get to the Father. Only by coming through Me can you get to the Father. That's exclusive. Jesus was teaching exclusivity. But that exclusivity was provided for all people. Jesus Christ died for all. But not all will take advantage of that which Jesus provided. And just that way is the church. Jesus died, purchased the church with His own blood. And so we find here, the church is exclusive. But who comprises or who makes up the church? The Bible tells us He is the Savior of the body. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. That tells me the saved are in the church, of which Jesus is Savior of. And so that tells me the saved are in the church, not the unsaved. Only those who have followed Jesus are now in the way, in the church. And so, as the Great Commission tells us, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, teaching them what? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Two things we need to be remind, uh, reminded of here. That is... As we make disciples, a disciple is made by, first of all, being baptized into Christ. But a disciple continues to being a disciple because a disciple is a learner, a student. And so therefore, once, once one has become a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, that person needs to keep learning, which implies that person needs to keep being taught. There has to be teaching 
and learning and growing for both parties. You know, the Bible tells us that, uh, that when a child is taught at a young age and when he is old, he won't forget those things. Well, that's true only if the child is a good student. You see, teaching and being a student are two different things, but they work together. If one doesn't want to be a student, what good is the teacher? And what good is the teaching? And so both have to work together. So in order for one to teach, there has to be one who's willing to learn. And one who's willing to learn has to have a teacher and something to be taught. So a Christian is a disciple. A disciple is a Christian or a learner or a student. And I think a lot of people, when they have arrived at the church, they think that's their final destination and they don't want to learn anymore. Or they refuse to learn anymore. But the learning is a process. It's a lifelong process where we need to learn, we need to grow because there is teaching that needs to be done. And the, the idea is that we will never learn it all. Brothers and sisters will never know it all. But we still need to learn and grow nonetheless. We need to learn. Never learning at all, but we're going to learn. And we're always going to learn something new as we study. But again, back to, back to the text of Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Now just a few verses later, Matthew records for us this thought. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so Matthew is kind of adding on to what he just said. There's a narrow gate and a narrow way. And that narrow way involves obedience. And that's what he's saying in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. And then he uses an illustration about the wise man and the foolish man. And the wise man, he built his house upon the rock. The sound teachings of Jesus Christ. And the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The traditions and the doctrines and the teachings of men. And his house fell down. Because it could not withstand the spiritual pressures that the Lord's teaching is designed to handle. And so it's imperative for each of us as children of God being in the way to undertake and to behold and to include in our lives the teachings of Jesus Christ. So to follow Jesus Christ is to follow the narrow way. There is no other way but the narrow way. The narrow way is His way. The church of Christ did not provide a narrow way. Jesus provided the narrow way for His church. That's the idea. The church of Christ teaches and preaches His way, the narrow way, but it is Jesus who provided that way again. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, he didn't say, I am a way. And he didn't say, I am a way among many other ways. He simply said, I am the way. There's no other way but through Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? It means there's no other way but through the word of Jesus Christ, the teachings of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he said in John chapter 5 and in verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me 
has everlasting life. He has passed from death unto life. By his word, we enter into life if we obey his word. So we were talking in Bible class, the idea that Jesus Christ died for the world. But not all the world will, will be saved. But there's a lot of people in the world who think that simply by virtue of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that all their sins are already and automatically forgiven. That's not so. Jesus tells us that even after the cross, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. What made the difference? How did we go from death to life? Was it by virtue of the cross of Jesus Christ and the shedding of His blood Himself? No. It was by His Word. He said, if you believe My Word, you have passed from death to life. Which is what Paul said. In not so many words. Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everybody. It makes no difference who you are. Everybody has the same opportunity. Enter into Christ, enter into His church by obeying or submitting to the gospel. That's how Jesus saves. In fact, he underscores that a few verses later. In John chapter 6, and beginning of verse 63, here's what he says. It's the Spirit who gives life. The Holy Spirit provides us life. How? How? Does He just come upon you and, and then says, you're mine? Does He throw some supernatural power upon you to make you His? No. That's not what Jesus said. Here is what Jesus said. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The Holy Spirit provided the words for Jesus who in turn preached the gospel. That's why once again we go back to Romans 1, for it is the gospel of God that is the power of God to salvation. The words. Those words are given by the Spirit. That's how the Spirit gives life through the words, through the message preached. And we have the message that was preached in writing. We call the sacred scriptures, the holy writings. We have all that. That's how the Spirit gives us life. It's His words, which means it's His way. Those words are His. Remember, Jesus told His apostles, I have many more things to tell you guys, but I can't right now because I've got to die for the world. And then not too long after that, I'm going to go back to the Father where I'll sit at the right, His right hand. But I'm going to send you guys another helper, the Holy Spirit. And He said, He will guide you into all truth. He will take My words and give them to you. And you will give them to the people. And you will write them as Holy Scripture. And so we have the words of the Spirit. The Spirit gives life through the Word. Remember, it's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. It's the Word the Spirit uses to help us along our way, on the way. Because Jesus is the way. And again, the way implies but one way. Not many. You know, there's a lot of religions in the world today. Buddhism, Shintoism, uh, uh, Islamism, uh, a lot of other isms that you could think of, Judaism. And they're all teaching that man needs to build this bridge to God. But Jesus comes along and He brings in Christianity. 
the way. And the way instructs us that man can't build a bridge to God. Only God can build a bridge to God. Man can walk over that bridge, but man cannot build that bridge. And that's what Jesus was teaching. And so we need to understand that there is but one way. And the one and only way is through the teachings of Jesus Christ that we find in the New Testament in our Bibles. And so there's two convictions that the first century church had. One is the inescapable idea that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. And those people lost their lives for that conviction. You know, it's interesting that you can read history from the second and third century Christians and how many were put to death by the Romans. And they were fed to the lions. And they were put into the Colosseum for all these fans to see them die in vile and wicked ways. But they went to their deaths as followers of Christ. They would not neglect their Savior. But the Romans tried to get them off that path, to get them out of that way, but their faith held strong in the way. What made the difference? What made the difference is that cross. That cross that had the blood of Jesus dripping down upon it and from it, that blood that was dripping down our Savior's body, that made the difference in their thinking. How about you? Does the blood of Jesus Christ focus your attention and focus your mind upon Jesus Christ and His Word and His teaching and His will for you and for me? Does your mind focus upon the way? The way. The way of salvation. The way of our Lord. That's what the first century church taught. The second thing, the sec, uh, second thing the first century church taught was that following Christ is the only way. And we'll close out here. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. We find Peter had just confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then just a few moments later he said, he tried to hold Jesus back he said, how, how, you're not going to be put to death. In fact, none of that will happen because we're not going to let it happen. And Jesus' response was, get behind me, Satan. He knew where that power was coming from. And Peter fell into that trap. And just after that, Jesus says these words. All those who desire to come after me, let him deny himself pick up his cross daily, according to Luke, pick up his cross daily and follow me. That's the only way. And it's a daily occurrence. It's a daily life cycle. We have to continue following him on a daily basis because we're going to face persecution, we're going to face temptation, and we're going to face the devil in so many varied ways trying to get us off the way. And so he says, deny yourself. You may want to go that direction with Satan, or you may want to go that direction with Satan, but deny your desires and give in to the desires of Jesus Christ. And then pick up that cross and follow Him on a daily basis. That's what the Christians taught. It was the cross of Jesus Christ that centered their lives and centered their focus. How about you? Jesus is calling you today. Jesus has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way that you can get to the Father is through Him. And Jesus said, here's the way. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you believe that, you can rest assured that you can put your soul in the hands of Jesus Christ this morning. 
by being baptized in a watery grave, having your sins washed away, and having that blood, the effective blood of Jesus Christ, to cleanse you from all your sins each and every day afterwards. Perhaps you've done that, but perhaps you've wandered off the way. Jesus says, come back to the way. Come back to what is right. Come back home to Jesus. He'll forgive you of all your sins through your repentance. If you're subject to Jesus Christ and to his invitation this morning, why don't you come as together we stand and sing.